5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Whatever was going on in the Jewish community, Jesus was, was a part of it and wanted to be a part of it because he had come to fulfill the law. And so the Jews were looking for a Messiah to come, and when he came, uh, he didn't come as they expected, but he came, and they, you know, we know that they rejected him. But all that he did while he was here in his public ministry was good. And uh, as he came to this pool of the Th Bethesda, he was going up to a feast at Jerusalem. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market or the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. I want you to notice that, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then at first after the troubling of the water stepped in, he was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now I'm going to start, stop right there and we'll have prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the reading of the Word of God this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to gather in the house of the Lord. I pray, God, Lord, that you bless us today. God, forgive me of my sins. God, I need to be clean. Uh, Father, that you might use me this morning, and I pray, God, forgiveness of sin, and I pray, God, we'd rightly divide the word of truth, and, Lord, may we leave here today encouraged by the word of God. I pray the Spirit of God would move behind this pulpit and take over this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd move up and down the aisles this morning, God, and touch our hearts for the glory of God. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we'll pick back up reading in verse number 5 in just a moment. But I want you to notice that this pool, by way of introduction, this pool of, of Bethesda had around it five porches. Now, I got studying what those five porches and why did it have five porches. It was a, it was a common thing for folks to go that were lame, impotent, without power on their own. It was a common thing for folks to go there and... and uh, and, and sat beside that pool waiting for the angel uh, to come down and stir the water. Now, I can't explain all that to you. Don't ask me. But I know that that's what happened because the Bible said so. And that angel would come to, to uh, disturb the water, to stir the water, and then whoever was able to get there on their own could get in and be healed. And so only a few, those that can maybe walk a little bit, someone, it would just do once, someone would go and get in the water and they would be healed of whatsoever disease that they had. Now we read on here in just a moment, those porches were probably put there by people that have, had been healed at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, maybe they had gotten healed and they wanted to. They, maybe while they were laying there, they had nowhere to, to get in out of the rain. Maybe they had nowhere to get in out of the sun. And so they came along, well, I, I knew how bad it was down here, and so I built a porch for maybe a few people to get under. And then along came somebody else, same situation, and they would build a porch, just, a, just an awning, just a covering around that pool. And, and uh, they said, well, you know, we'll do the same thing. So five people have built porches. And I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's by coincidence that the number is five, and I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But, but they built those five porches, and then, you know, whoever was there, and people went there every day. People went there every day hoping that the water would be troubled and they would be in to be healed of whatever disease they had. Look, they came there with all kinds of infirmities. They came there with, you know, with uh, not being able to walk, maybe not being able to see, not being able to hear, whatever it was, but they came with all kinds of infirmities. I'll tell you something, friend. It don't matter what kind, what shape, or what situation someone's in, they can always get to God. Amen? And no matter, no matter what they may have in life, no matter what problems they may have in life, no matter, uh, uh, you know, what kind of condition at all they're in, they can still get to God. Amen? There's still opportunity for folks to get to the Lord. And I'll say here today, if someone happens to be here lost without God, you've got time right now, amen, to come to the Lord. Now, you might not have time tomorrow, but there's time today for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And so we find here in verse number 5, there was a certain man. And uh, I don't, don't have his name, don't know who he was. But Jesus, as he did at the well of Samaria, at the woman at the well of Samaria, remember he said, I must needs go through Samaria. 
Well, no doubt in my mind, even though the scripture doesn't say it, when he went by that pool of Bethesda, there was a certain man there, and I believe that Jesus had him on his mind and saw him when the, that he was headed that way to see this particular man because the Bible says it was a certain man. Uh, many around there, but a certain man that Jesus had went to call on that day. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years, 38 years. 38 years. I'm only 20 years older than that. I done told you, didn't I? But that's all right. He was 38 years he had been coming to this pool of Bethesda. And every day he would come. And I'll tell you something. You say, well, why did he keep coming? Because he had enough faith to believe that if he ever got there, that, that he, something would, would happen to him. How did he get there? Someone must have had to bring him. But he had enough faith to come for 38 years. So 38 years he had been there. And <clears throat> verse 6, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time, in that case he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now you remember Christ knows the end from the beginning. He knew the answer before he asked that. But he, he wanted the man to admit, answer the question, Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? And for now, I'll tell you today, the question to the lost man is, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved? The question to the backslidden Christian is, do you want to be right with the Lord? And my friend, this man answered the question. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said to him, Arise. Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Now Jesus did not say to him, he did not say to him, well, when the angel troubles the water again, I'll get you down there before everybody else. <coughs> no, Jesus took matters into his own hands as he, as he always can and does. He said, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And after that man laid there 38 years, the words from the Lord Jesus, how sweet they must have been, because, and immediately, verse 9, and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Oh, immediately, right away, he knew that he'd been touched with the power of God. Amen? And I'll tell you, when somebody's lost and gets saved, immediately they know that they've been touched with the power of God. They know that they've come to know the Savior when the, when the Lord Jesus moves into their heart. Immediately they're able to get up and know that they're saved by the grace of God. So this man, he'd been 38 years laying there, and you wonder after, and I have to wonder, I'm this kind of person that wonders what kind of shape the man was in physically. Uh, he, you know, uh, there are a whole lot more happened, I believe, right at the moment than that man just getting up. I believe God touched his legs. I believe God touched his muscles. I believe he touched his body and not only gave him, the, uh, gave him the ability to walk, but I believe he gave him the strength and gave him a healthy body all at one time. So he proved that by Scripture. Well, he said, take up thy bed and walk. Now, I've seen people that have been bedridden for many years, and usually they have no, uh, have no muscle tone in their legs. And if they've been able to get up by and move around by a wheelchair, they've got muscles in their arms, but they can't walk physically. They could not walk. I broke my, I broke my ankle about 30 years ago, somewhere thereabouts. And uh, I did something foolish is the reason I broke my ankle. And instead of admitting how old I was and not trying to do everything those teenagers were doing, uh, I tried also to do something they were doing and did it, did it good until they said, let's go get the football. And I was waiting around for them to go get the football. And no tell us what happened if we'd have wound up in a football game. I might not be here today. But they said, go get the football. So I'm standing around there. Been riding a skateboard, okay? I'll tell you. Been riding a skateboard. And... Uh, uh, while he's going to get the football, it's taking a little long. I said, I'm going to take one more ride on that skateboard. Wish I'd have never done that. I, sh I should have given up while I was ahead. I should have quit while I was ahead. But I got on that skateboard, and I'm going down the driveway. And it's not real steep, you know. And I've done that several times and done pretty good. I was proud of myself. And I thought, I'm going to show him I'm going to do it again. And somehow I got a little close to the edge of the driveway. And there was a little rock laying right, a little rock laying right, and I hit that rock and I fell. And of course, uh, I fell on my ankle. And I, when I looked down, when I looked down at my, this one, when I looked down at my left ankle, my right ankle, it was looking back at me. The bottom of my foot was turned up, looking back at me. 
I knew that was not right. I mean, I knew that, you know, that ain't the way that's supposed to look. But nothing more for me to do than to reach down there and turn it back around right. Well, I was in a mess. And so he got me to the hospital. A doctor come out there and he said, look, he said, you'll never use that ankle again. You broke it all to pieces. I count at least 38 breaks. And uh, the best we can hope for is to take a, a, a piece of bone out of your hip and fuse your ankle together, and uh, you're done. He said, that's all we can do for you. Well, I thought, that's something to tell a fella, you know. I mean, I hunt and fish, and, man, I'm all, you know, I get out in the woods, dig ginseng, go coon hunting. I've done all that, all that stuff and still get out and deer hunt and fish. And I thought, man, and all that flashed before my eyes was not getting to go fishing anymore. Now, ain't that something? But that's the first thing I thought of. I can't go to the trout stream no more. Well, he, he said, but I'm going to say it. And he said, we'll do another x-ray, and I'll be able to tell you more. So he grabbed a hold of my ankle. I'd done been down there messing with it. He grabbed a hold of my ankle and looked me in the eye, and he pulled it. Oh, my goodness. He pulled it, and he straightened it up, and he, I mean, I about passed out for the pain. So he put me back in there, and he said, well, he said, I got some better news for you. He said, really, it's only broke badly in three places. And he said, we can put some, a pin and some screws in there, and uh, you should be all right. I thought, well, I get to go fishing. Now, I'm telling you, that's what I thought. What I was thinking about most was not being out of work, uh, not having to, I was thinking about going fishing. Now, I know that's bad, and y'all forgive me for it because I've learned better since then. But, but uh, I, I came back to what happened in South Carolina. I came back up here and had surgery, and, uh, got it all put back together, and now it works fine. Don't have no trouble out of it, and I'm 10% disabled in it, but I can't get none out of that. So I just have to live with that. But anyway, I. I, I went on and, you know, and I, but I, well, after he'd done surgery, I was down for eight weeks. And so eight weeks, I had a, a big heavy cast on my, they don't put the plastic things in, had a big heavy cast on my leg. And uh, I'm a pretty big fella anyway, and uh, that's part of what started me being a pretty big fella, sitting around for eight weeks without doing nothing. But I, after I went to the doctor, and, and, uh, and the doctor warned me, he said, you ain't going to like what you see when I take this cast off. And I, he said, you, you know, it's going to, your legs aren't going to look good at all. But he said, it's fine. It'll all change back. And so <clears throat> that nurse came in there and like to scare me to death. She's going to take that off. And she comes in there with a little saw. And she said, I'm on the saw. I said, you're what? I said, you're going to put that thing. And she said, it don't turn around around. It just vibrates. So she put it on there and she ripped that thing off of there. Me and, and she took me and my, my leg wasn't that big around. I mean, it just looked like my arm. I thought, that can never work. I can never do with this. And so for the ne I'd lost all the muscle tone in my leg. I mean, it was just, you know, it just, it looked gross. It looked uh, grotesque. And I thought, I, this, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I'm still never going to walk again because I'd been that long, just eight weeks without using that leg and all the muscle tone had gone. Well, you can tell it's all back to normal. And I, I get to do all the things I like to do outside. But it took a while for that to happen. This man had said all that, not just to tell you that story, but to tell you this. This man had laid 38 years without the use of his legs. <coughs> so what must he have looked like? No muscle tone. So it makes it even a greater miracle to me that, he, he, that after the Lord said, Arise, take up thy bed and walk, that immediately the man was up and walking. God restored not only his ability to walk, but he, he restored his ability and his muscles <clears throat> and his body to be able to carry on. I don't know if he'd ever, you know, I don't know if he could remember how to walk, but God put all that back together for this man. So he said, Will thou be made whole? And the man told him why, and he said, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And he did it, and it was on the Sabbath day. Verse 10, The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. Is it not lawful for thee to carry thy bed? Now, what kind of religious hypocrites and Pharisees is this? The man had been laying for 38 years, and all they're concerned about is not that his legs are healed, not that he's able to get up and work and walk and work and be a part of society, but that, he's, that they're so religious and, and, and so much a point to the law that they're, you know, they're accusing him of uh, carrying his bed on Sunday when he shouldn't be, or on the Sabbath, not Sunday, on the Sabbath when he shouldn't be. And the, uh, the Jews therefore said to him, that was cured, is, it is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. 
Then asked they him, What man is that which saith to thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said, Now where's the first place a man went after he got, after he got made whole? He went to church. He went to the temple. Now I'm telling you, friends, somebody gets right with the Lord, they're going to go to church. They're going to, be, they're going to be in God's house, and that's where he went. He went to the temple. <coughs> Uh, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said to him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. So apparently sin was a part of that. Sin was a part of the, of the cause of that. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Jesus answered, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only had broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father, making him also equal with God. Now, I'm going to quit right there, the reading. Now, listen, this man that was laying by the pool had been laying there 38 years. Jesus came along and healed him, and, of course, they were immediately again trying to destroy Jesus, but his hour was not yet come. Now, back to the, back to the five porches, and I'll give you five things real quickly, and we'll be gone. The five porches are representative, and I, I think they, you know, I, I've thought many, many thoughts on this. And I want to I wanna give you a little illustration this morning on the representation of these five porches. It can, it can mean a whole lot. It may mean something entirely different to you. But these five porches, number one, these five porches speak to me of the grace of God. Five, the number of Scripture, is the grace of God. And one of these five porches probably the fifth porch, and we'll go backwards, represents the grace of God. And we see that also, and I don't think it's by coincidence, I know that the translators are the ones that divided the, the, the Word of God into chapter and verse, but you've got to thank God had a hand even in that because it's the fifth chapter of John. The number of grace is the number five. And we see in these one of these porches, we see that the grace of God was made sufficient for this man at the pool of Bethesda. And I'll tell you what, friends, sometimes you and I need to crawl up under the grace of God. We need to crawl up on that porch of the grace of God and experience God's grace. Every day you experience the grace of God. Every day it's because of the grace of God that you're able to get up in the morning and go about whatever you're doing for the day. It's all by the grace of God. If it wasn't for that, friend, we'd be miserable all the time. We would be, But God's grace is what helps us to continue on. The grace of God is what helps us to, to serve the Lord and do the will of God is the grace of God. So we'll say porch number five is the grace of God. Who, what was on that porch is God's grace. Friend, you're going to need more of the grace of God as this world goes on and as life goes on. You and I are going to need a multitude and abundant grace of God. The well of grace of God never runs dry. His grace is sufficient. Many songs are sung about the grace of God, amazing grace. His grace is sufficient for me. All those things point to this, that God's grace is sufficient. Amen? You'd never make it. I'd never make it. Listen, if it wasn't for God's grace, then none of us be here today. It's by the grace of God that you and I are what we are and that we're here today. So we see the porch of grace, and this man needed the grace of God, and this man received the grace of God because why? God's grace is sufficient. Now you wonder how people get through what they're going through. Miss Liz laying over there in, in uh, Madison Manor. She'd love to be at church this morning. I guarantee you that she would be here today if she could. But you know what? Uh, they're probably having a service over there of some kind, and she's probably at it. But you know what to help her get through this? The grace of God. Sister, you're, you're having him, sir. God's grace will get you through that. My wife had both knees replaced. God's grace got her through that. I had my ankle. God's grace got her through that. You've had many things in your life that you can remember where it took the grace of God or you wouldn't have made it through. Amen. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is real. And God's grace will do when nothing else will. God's grace will do. I've lost, I've lost people to death. And, and, <coughs> and you know what gets a family through a period of time when there's a catastrophe in the family or a disaster or a death? It's the grace of God. Now, you and I today, 
don't have dying grace, but when the day comes for us to go and be with the Lord, we'll have dying grace. I've experienced that with others. I've been at their bedside when they draw their last breath, and I've saw the grace of God move in and take over, and they die, no, die well in the Lord. God's people die well by the grace of God. Amen. So we see ports number five, the grace of God. We see ports number four, the grace, the, the port of the porch of salvation. Aren't you glad you got on the porch? Amen. Aren't you glad you got on that porch of salvation? Now, I don't know when you got saved. I don't know if you got saved. But I know I can remember and I go back to it once in a while when the devil tries to tell me that there's nothing real about my salvation. I take him right back to the board. Amen. In my mind. The board on the floor of the altar where I got birthed into the family of God. Hallelujah. And I go back and say, God, I think I got on the porch of salvation. Amen. Born again, going to live forever, going to live as long as God does because I got on the porch of salvation. They can't nothing knock me off, amen. They can't nothing drag me away, amen, because I'm saved by the grace. Do you remember the day you got on the porch of salvation? Do you remember the day that, that, that God touched your heart and you realized that you were a sinner and you bowed and you called upon him and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Do you remember the day? That's the day you got on the porch of salvation. But preacher, I've never had that experience in my life. Listen, you're not on the porch of salvation. The Bible says you must be born again. The Bible says, uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You must be born again. You must be saved to get on that porch of salvation. But I'm so glad for the day. And you remember back in your mind, Lord, that's the day I got on the porch. That's the day I got under the shelter of God's love and God's plan for my life. That's the day that you saved me. And now because of your grace, because of salvation's plan, I'm saved for all eternity. Amen. You ought to get excited. That ought to be something that excites all of us to remember that we're saved, but we're going to heaven when we leave this world. Amen. Somebody say amen. I'm going to start having to pull them out from under my pulpit now if you don't help me out a little bit here. Amen. I've got a few down under there left. I checked a while ago. Amen. If you don't help me out, I'm going to have to start pulling my from under the hot to open my door down here. Amen. But listen, we ought to be real excited when we know that we're on the porch of salvation. We're going to live forever in heaven. Amen. The lost man can't say that. The lost man can't do that. Why? Because he ain't on the porch. He's out wandering around and lost without God, without hope. And except he be born again, he'll die and go to hell without God. See, we're on the porch. We're under the shelter of God's plan of salvation. Number three, we find a, a porch of love and peace. Now, that's you hear a lot about love and peace in this world today, but there's neither either one. There's not much of either one in the world today. The whole world is hollering for peace, peace. But yet what's happening more and more, more violence, more terrorism, more war, more destruction. And you look around and you see how that, you know, pe the people holler for love. Valentine's Day, a day of love. But I bet the crime rate was just as bad as it was the day before. And people holler for love and, and, the, and, then, the, and then there's all the killing and all the things that go on. There's more hate in the world today. I'm sorry, friend, but I'm afraid there's getting to be more hate in the world today than there is love. But guess what? I'm on the porch of peace and love. When I got saved, I got peace with God. I experienced the love of Christ that he had for lost sinners when I got saved. So I'm on that. Listen, no matter what the world does, there's a peace in my heart that the world can't take. Amen. There's a peace in my, in my soul that no matter what the devil comes around with, he can't have it. Amen. It, he can, God put it in there and he can't have it. I've got the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Friend, I'm telling you, that kind of peace, the world will never know except they turn to God. They'll never know peace except they turn to God. There's some scary things going on in this world, but I'm glad I got peace in my soul, amen, no matter what happens, amen, no matter what, the, what, what happens next, there's peace in my soul that the devil or the world can't get. They can't have it. God says he's mine and you can't have him, amen. So there's the peace of God 
that passeth all understanding. There's a love, the love of God that produced salvation in me that the world can't have. They can't have. And, and, and you know, love in people's hearts have, has become something that's not real. And that's sad to say, but true love is hard to find. True love is hard to, you know, hard to, to see anymore because of all the, all the things of the world that the world has, has, has showed and said this is love and when it's not love. But I'll tell you what, Jesus loves me and Jesus loves you. And the greatest gift to all the world was the gift of love that God gave his son to die on the cross of Calvary. Guess what? For me and for you. So that what? We can have peace in our hearts. Have you got peace this morning? You say, preacher, I've got all kinds of problems. I've all got all kinds of troubles. I've got things going on. But listen, if you're saved by the grace of God, these things are temporal. They will only last for a little time. And then, friend, all the cares of life are going to be gone and done away with. That's the kind of peace you can rest assured to lay down on your bed at night and go to sleep. It was the wind. Did the wind blow over here last night? Ha, ha, ha. That's a joke. I'm sorry. But listen, I, I live in a pretty cozy little house. It's not a big house, but it's a cozy house. But I'm telling you what, the wind blowed so hard, I had to hang on to the bed to keep them being blown out on the floor. And I, about, about 2 o'clock, I, I took a nap, and I wasn't real sleepy last night, and I took a nap yesterday evening. And uh, I woke up, and my wife said, What is that? Well, she was awake, and... Uh, I heard something, just a bang, wham, clang. And I thought, well, it ain't my trash can. Probably that's the neighbor's trash can. So I, the, the light came on outside, and I looked, and here comes somebody's swimming pool rolling right through my yard and down the road. Now, there ain't much peace in that. I like to never went back to sleep. I thought, that's a strange, you know, that makes you think, you know, that's the strangest thing I've seen, I guess, in a long time in the middle of the night is some little kid's swimming pool just rolling right down I mean, just a going. And I thought, now, where's that going to land at? And who's going to come looking for it? And where in the world did that come from? So I laid there thinking about that for a little while. Well, I finally went on. But listen, I'm telling you something, friend. The peace that God gives you in your soul, even when the, you know, I finally went back to sleep. And you know the last thing I was worried about when I went back, went back to sleep was the wind blowing. Because it hadn't stopped. I had one wind gust last night, 31 mile an hour. And uh, that, I think that's the one where I was holding on to the bed. Keep, but listen, all that was going on, all that went on last night, when I finally got to sleep, I didn't wake up another time. I slept like a baby till I woke up. I wasn't worried about the wind. You say, what if a tree falls on your house? Amen. I bet hope for you will. Hallelujah. Amen. Do I want that to happen? No. But I'm telling you, I'm ready to meet God. Amen. I've got peace in my heart that the world can't have. And I can go in this world knowing that the troubles of this world are everywhere. But I've got peace in my heart. Amen. When I, I got, I'm in the hands of God, you're in the hands of God. Say, preacher, what's going to go on with all the terrorists? I have no idea. Well, are they going to attack America? I've got no idea. Probably so. But it ain't use me leaving, losing sleep about it. God's got it under control. God knows what's going on. Amen. I've got, are y'all with me? Amen. I've got peace. Have you got peace? Porch number four. No, we've already been there. Porch number four, this porch, yeah. I'm backwards on my outline, it's okay. The porch of security. The porch of security. Let me ask you something. Is your, is your life secure? I'll tell you something, if you're saved by, grace, by the grace of God, your life's secure. We're living in a world where the stock market is up and down. Gold prices are up and down. You can't find no security in anything. You've got to lock your house up when you leave to go get the mail, just about it. Nothing is as secure as it used to be. But guess what? I'm on the porch of security, and I know God's going to take care of me. Amen. Now, I don't live a foolish life. I don't live a reckless life. You know, I, I, I try to use good judgment most of the time. And sometimes I'm like you. I do something kind of crazy, but, but I try to use good judgment. And I don't, you know, I don't put myself in a place where I'm going you know, to get in, in 
uh, trouble or anything like that. But I know I want you to know one thing. I live my life and I don't worry and I don't fret about the world about the world's condition. You drive yourself nuts if you worry about it all the time. God's got it in His hand. We're secure in Him. The children of Israel, when they left uh, the when they uh, uh, left the land of Goshen and they moved out of Egypt, they were completely dependent upon God for their daily sustenance, their daily life. They had to have Him. But God saw them for 40 years. God saw them. They never went hungry. They never went without clothes. They never went without shelter. They never went without water. Why? They were secure in the promise of God. Now God tells me, he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. This world is insecure, but thank God, friend, by God's grace, saved in the grace of God, I'm secure in him. Amen. And that brings me to the last point. I'm secure in him because of number five, I experienced one day the porch of mercy. I was lost and undone without God or his son, but he reached out his hand for me. I was at the mercy of God. When I was lost, I was on my way to hell, and the devil had me by the horns, and he was taking me to hell with him. But when Jesus came along, I, was, I saw the mercy of God. And it's by the mercy of God that he didn't strike me dead before. It's by the mercy of God that you're sitting here today, lost or saved. It's because of God's mercy. Amen. But oh, thank God, friend. When I got saved, I was under the mercy of God. And God shed his mercy on me until I got right with him. You know why lost people are still living today? is because of the mercy of God. You know why people get an opportunity to be saved? Because God's a merciful God. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And my God, amen, the merciful God that he is, that's the reason he ain't wiped this whole world out. My God, because the merciful God he is, is the reason he sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary to save you and I from uh, uh, hell in which we deserve. Why? Because of the mercy of God. Without his mercy, friend, we'd all be lost and on our way to hell. Thank God for the porch of mercy. So, friend, today let me ask you, are you on the porch? Are you on the porch? Are you on the porch of mercy? Are you on the porch of grace? Are you on the porch of his love? And I could go on and on and, and talk on and on about the porches that, that uh, he has got for us, the porch of grace, the porch of mercy, the porch of love, the porch of salvation, on and on and on. But are you, on the, are you in the Lord? Is the Lord in you? Are you saved by the grace of God? If you are, friend, you're in good shape today. Amen. It may be cold outside, but it's hot in your heart. Amen. It's warm in your heart. But oh, my friend, today I'm glad I got on the porch one day. You remember that. This man, he was on one of the porches. He was on the porch of mercy when Jesus walked by and saved, and saved him and healed him by his grace. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. Blessed, I pray. God, we just thank you, Lord, for all your good grace that you've shown toward us. And Lord, we're unworthy to even call upon thy name. But again, thank you for your grace. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Every head bowed, no one looking around.